Okay, we'll get started with the next talk. Moritz is going to talk about the Maggie software. <laughs> yeah, good morning. My name is Moritz. I'm a software engineer at Logical Clocks, a company uh, developing an open source platform for scale out machine learning. Um, and today I'm going to talk about uh, asynchronous hyperparameter optimization on Spark and on Hopsworks. That's how the platform is called. Um, to start out, a bit of a controversial statement from last year in an essay of uh, Rich Sutton, also known as the father of reinforcement learning. Um, and basically what he says is that uh, you shouldn't add human intelligence to your model development, but instead the future of AI is our methods that scale with available compute. And two of those methods that seem to scale are search and learning. Um, so you heard Spark, so a lot of people will say, well, Spark scales with available compute, so Spark is the answer. But it's actually not that easy because Spark is a bulk synchronous system. And to make it really efficient, you would need asynchronism. And today I'm going to show you how you can still do it on Spark. Um, if we look at distribution and deep learning, um, we don't want to lose our generalization error, so what methods do we actually have available to uh, improve the generalization error? Uh, we can use better regularization, hyperparameter optimization, larger training data sets, better models, or better optimization algorithms, but actually where we can apply distribution is in these three parts. And um, when we look at it, we usually speak about two loops. The inner loop, which is the stochastic gradient descent training, and we can apply distribution that, to that fairly efficiently, and also in Spark, uh, we can use a bunch of workers and use the all-reduce uh, strategy um, to scale the inner loop out. Um, a bit more complicated is the actually the outer loop, which we call the search loop, um, where we have to basically generate trials that we think are promising, and we actually need to train them to return a single metric. It behaves like a black box. We don't have any uh, gradient information available to optimize this loop. So we have to rely on much less efficient methods and make more greedy methods like random search or uh, Bayesian optimization. Um, the inner loop is what we call the learning, and uh, the outer loop is the search. Uh, but in reality, if you look at it, if you look at your process of building a machine learning model, um, this means if you want to deploy that efficiently at scale, this, this loop, these two loops, that means rewriting your training code actually a, a lot of times because usually you start out exploring and designing your model on maybe just a Python kernel, single host, uh, but then when you do experiments, you want to scale it out maybe you want to use Spark, and then finally you want to do data parallel training or model parallel training on a lot of data. And, but the problem is that usually you have to be iterating. So you might notice something in your experiment, so you have to go back to your single host environment, change the code, then rewrite your code to actually fit your distribution context, um, which results in a lot of code changes that you need to track and uh, keep a history of to keep your experiments actually re reproducible and your models. Um, so how we want to do it is uh, with an abstraction that we call the oblivious training function. Um, we're trying to um, abstract out all the dependencies so that we have a single training function um, where we want the user to put all his training code inside. Uh, just like on a normal single host Python environment, and then we will do the parameterization for you. For example, with uh, model generator functions or uh, hyperparameters, um, there's different ways to do it. So going back to the outer loop, if you look at it sequentially, um, we have a learning black box. We don't have any gradient information, which returns a single metric, and that's the metric we want to optimize, a loss or accuracy uh, over some search space. And uh, ideally, um, this is not just applying to black box optimization, but uh, all kinds of search problems, and we can replace that with a global controller, so we can actually also use it for, for example, ablation studies, where we leave out certain components of the, of the model to see what actually is the contribution of that 
component of the model to my final uh, outcome of the model or final quality of the model. Um, so how can we scale this? Uh, actually, those learning black boxes are independent, so uh, we can add multiple workers and run them in parallel. But the problem is how do we actually schedule the, the trials on there? Um, that's why we need to add some kind of queue. So we would like to produce trials ahead of time. And every time a worker gets idle, he can just take a trial from the queue, which is some kind of hyperparameter combina combination, and start training it. Um, and ideally, we would like to keep the global information over all the learning curves that we are training uh, available in, the, in this controller to make smart decisions on which trials to process next. Um, so, but then the question is, which algorithm, algorithm do we actually use for search? Um, how do we monitor progress? How do we actually collect the metrics and aggregate the results? And what about fault, toler fault tolerance? If we lose one of the workers, we don't want to lose days of experimentation progress. So um, how do we take that into, into account? Um, so we said this should be managed with platform support. And uh, that's why we started the project called Maggie. It's a flexible framework to run asynchronous parallel hyperparameter, or not only hyperparameter experiments, but any kind of trials for machine learning. And it supports a bunch of algorithms like asynchronous successive halving, random search, grid search, leave one component out, ablation, Bayesian optimization, and we're working on more. Um, so synchronous search is actually quite straightforward to implement on Spark. Um, Say you have random search, you generate 10 trials, uh, you start 10 tasks, each task is going to train a single trial, you wait until all of them finish, uh, and then afterwards you might generate more or um, you stop the experiment there. Um, the problem is that once you add early stopping or asynchronous algorithms, you don't make efficient use of your, of your resources because hyperparameters greatly influence the, run, the, the training time. So um, some of the models will finish early, some will take longer. But in Spark, you will have to wait until you reach the end of your stage to start actually a new stage. And when you do directed search, for example, by Asian optimization, you would need to wait until all those tasks in the first stage finish to, to update your Bayesian model and generate new trials. And we don't want that. Um, so. And there are a bunch of more uh, methods. I already said it, early stopping. Um, you can do early stopping based on the single learning curve, but actually more efficient or more better early stopping rules are ba based on all the information you have available, all the learning curves. For example, median stopping rule, or you can predict the per performance curve, the final outcome, or so-called multi-fidelity methods like successive halving, where you give different budgets to each of your trials, depending on how uh, likely it is that it's a good trial. So you try to see, oh, this is a good trial, so I want to tra train it more epochs to be really sure that it's a, a good trial. As you, For example, as you see here, this is successive halving. You start with eight trials, but you only continue with the best four, best half uh, with the training until the end. You have only one trial left. Um, I already said it briefly. Um, you can also use this for ablation studies by just replacing the optimizer with an ablator who leaves out certain components of your net neural network at a time. For example, feature ablation or leaving out components of your network like layers, for example. Um, so yeah, the challenge is how can we fit this in the, into the Spark bulk synchronous execution model? Because we have a mismatch between what we define as a trial and uh, the task and stages in, in Spark. Um, and how do we do that? We, we actually block the executors in Spark with long-running tasks and allow for communication between the drivers and, uh, and those tasks by setting up an RPC framework in between. So this way, we can um, basically, when, once a task starts, it registers with the, with the server that's running on the Spark driver asks, say, here, I'm here, I'm available to do work, and the, the driver or the optimizer can send a, a trial configuration to that task, which start, then starts training uh, the model with those parameters. 
And uh, at the same time, we can do uh, heart beating. So once these trials started training, they, be, uh, they heart beat back the, the current training accuracy or loss. Uh, so we can do early, global early stopping decisions. For example, say one trial is performing worse than, than the median of all other trials at comparable parts, uh, t points in time in the, in the training. Then we say, OK, stop this. Start a new one right away. Um, this is not worth my time. Um, how does it look like inside of Maggie? Um, the first thing we do when the Spark driver starts is we uh, start a little RPC server. And basically, this RPC server can receive messages from the clients, which are started in the, in the Spark tasks. And every time it receives a message, it puts it in a queue for the optimizer. Uh, the optimizer is going to modify some shared data, and every time the, RP, uh, the server receives a heartbeat from the current trial that's running, it will look up the shared data and see, is there, should I stop this trial or should I continue? And uh, this has a few advantages because we're running this on Hopsworks, so we have a REST API available, and we can register this Maggie server with Hopsworks, and um, we can start another client in, in the Jupyter notebook uh, that can connect to the server later and get us, for example, logs or the current metrics. So we get actually live feedback inside the Jupyter Notebook how my uh, experiment is, is performing at the moment, uh, which is very nice because so far you always had to go to the Spark UI, open the, the logs of your executors, and check uh, what's going on. Um, yes, how does it look like from the user API? Um, it's quite straightforward. Uh, you have to define a search space, which has a few different uh, hyperparameter cate categories, uh, integers, doubles, or uh, categ categorical or discrete uh, hyperparameters. And then, like I said, we want you to define one single training function that contains all your logic uh, for your model. Uh, giving the parameters as arguments to the function. And the only thing we need you to do is adding a callback either to your Keras or TensorBoard, uh, TensorFlow model, um, which creates the connection between Maggie and actually your, your user code. So we, you have to tell it um, which metric to actually broadcast back or heartbeat back to, to the Maggie driver to optimize and you should return the same final accuracy uh, metric. And then finally, last but not least, uh, you can lagom your experiment. Lagom is Swedish, and it means just the right amount, so not too much, not too little. Uh, you give it your search space, the optimizer you want to use, and the number of trials, and there's a bunch of more parameters you can set. Um, you can also implement your own custom optimizers. Uh, it's straightforward, just implementing a abstract class with three methods, and you can also do your own uh, early stopping components if you want to. From the ablation API, um, currently it supports Keras, the sequential API, because you can give labels to your layers and components in, in your model, and, and then you can define, a, with Maggie, you can define an ablation study where you tell it which components of your model to ablate one at a time, basically. Uh, or which features. And then the same thing again, uh, you define a single training function to run to run it with. Uh, some, some results. Um, actually, what you should observe here is two things. On the left, we have a, a model which is actually quite stable, so the hyperparameters don't change the accuracy that much of the model. And as we can see, the, the asynchronous algorithm, ASHA, um, it's not that much better, but actually it finds his be its best configuration already after half the time. And then we have like half of the time of the rest of the experiment to actually train the model uh, with more data, for example. And, but the real benefit comes in when you, when you have a model that's sensitive to um, hyperparameters. And we've seen that a lot with GANs, for example, uh, where early stopping plays a role because a lot of the models actually perform really bad depending on the hyperparameters. And with uh, Maggie, you can basically have a lot more exploration in, in, in your search space because you can perform many more trials in the same time. Um, 
I'll do a demo in a second, just some conclusions. Um, yeah, you should avoid iterative hyperparameter optimization and automate your experiments because yeah, black box optimization is hard, iterative development is slow. Um, there are actually state-of-the-art algorithms that can be deployed asynchronously, such as Bayesian optimization, particle swarm optimization, um, ASHA, the asynchronous successive halving, and yeah, you, you can use Maggie to do that. Um, and it saves you resources and um, helps you with the API, with the ablation API to better understand your models, uh, um, especially when they're sensitive or sensible to hyperparameters. Um, what's next? We want to develop more algorithms um, and we really want to provide distribution transparency so that once you define your training function, you do not have to rewrite it to run it in different contexts. If you run it on your local machine or if you run it uh, in, on Spark to scale out the, the experiments or if you do data parallel training, um, this shouldn't matter. matter. Uh, then a big problem in this area is actually comparability and reproducibility of experiments. Um, so maybe we can work on uh, making experiments more comparable if you can run them on Spark clusters with a certain uh, configuration, they should always reproduce the same uh, outcomes. And then something else we're working on is implicit provenance, as you will see in a second. Basically, because we have this training function that we call for the user, so it's not the user anymore that calls his own code, um, we can do a lot of stuff around it. For example, tracking artifacts that you're producing and um, tracking the code changes instead of you having to actually write uh, a call to a lifecycle management tool like MLflow, where you do mlflow.log, these parameters, this metric, uh, we can do all, all of that for you actually in the background. And we need to add support for PyTorch. Um, so let me do a quick demo. I, s I started a, a Spark application with on Hopsworks with now just three executors, a little bit of memory uh, for each of the executors. And um, as you can see, um, I define the search space. In this case, it's a simple MNIST model, convolutional model. So I define a kernel, a pooling, uh, the size of the pooling for the pooling layer. And you can also add additional parameters one by one, for example, the dropout rates. Um, then just import the experiment module from Maggie, uh, the Keras batch and um, callback to provide the connection to, to Maggie and broadcast back the metrics. And then you just have your normal uh, model specification as you do in Keras, as you've been doing it on your local machine probably. And you add the callbacks here. Um, and once you've got that, uh, you can start the experiment. And because we have this local client in, in actually in Jupyter running, once the job starts, it's going to take a few seconds to start the executors. Uh, we can get the progress of track the progress of the experiment inside Jupyter with a nice progress bar, and you can even call when you call print in, inside your training function. Um, they will show up here uh, below in your Jupyter notebook, so it's really nice to debug actually because we've seen a lot of users, they get scared when they hear Spark because they know they're not going to get their printouts back into their Jupyter notebook. They have to go to the Spark UI and um, that's really cumbersome. So as you see, the model started training now uh, in Epoch 1, three machines. The, Yes, three machines and the experiments running. And then, as I said, we're working on provenance. So we are actually tracking this experiment for you. As you can see, I have an experiment running here now. Um, if you look at the finished ones before, you can look at the hyperparameter combinations, the metrics they produced, uh, the logs of the, the single trials, um, the experiment directory on HDFS, um, and, for example, also 
the notebook that you used, so it's versioned for you uh, to run this experiment, and also the Conda environment with all your dependencies in it uh, to reproduce the experiment. Um, and you can open TensorBoard. If that takes a few seconds, usually. Uh, we can maybe go back for a second now. There it is. Um, yeah. And you can look at your experiment. It's loading for in the background. Yeah. Here you can see all your, <clears throat> all your trials. You can look at the learning curves. Um, yes, to get a better understanding of your experiments. Um, yes, that's it from my side. I, I'm open to questions. Here are some acknowledgments of colleagues and contributors. Thank you. Thank you. Please stay seated while we do questions so there's not a lot of noise. Any questions for Moritz? Uh, hi. Uh, in the, I think the last, um, the second slide you mentioned these parallel workers, where you train the data at each one of the parallel workers. Yes. Do you train, do you train part of the data at each parallel worker, or you train the full data set at each parallel worker, and oh. then you can you, you compare like the, the the overall results, or somehow you're aggregating the models. That's I don't um, fully understand. It's basically based on ring all reduce. So each of the worker trains on a subset of the data. And after each gradient descent step, uh, base, uh, they send. You update all these models. Exactly. So they, they pass the, the gradients to their neighbor, uh, all of them, and aggregate the, the gradients and then uh, continue with the next step. Iteration. But then you still get just one model at the end that is not trained at the full data set. It just trained at part of the, of the data set. So how you can make sure that the, the, the end model has somehow been trained on all the data set, not just parts of it at each parallel worker that you have? Because you, you're allocating a part of the training data set to each worker such that all the data you want to use is actually allocated to some worker. OK. Um, that's, yeah, data parallel training. That's how okay. it works. Yeah, great. Okay. And uh, this RPC uh, uh, function is been already integrated in the Maggie. So like yes. the user doesn't want to uh, bother with any stuff of RPC no. calls between anything. It just comes with the, with the framework. Exactly. So as you see, you just write your normal code inside okay. a Jupyter notebook. You just have to import the library. Uh, okay. So we want to hide all the complexity exactly, yeah. about distribution from, from okay. the user. Yeah, great. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, there's one. Yeah, here on the right. Hi. I couldn't really understand uh, what is the algorithm behind the optimization. Can you choose it or it's like brute force? No, you can choose it as uh, either you can implement your own one if you have a special one in mind. Uh, but uh, we provide a bunch of them out of the box. For example, random search, grid search, um, ASHA, which is really, yeah, it's considered state of the art at the moment. It produces really good results and it's not even directed yet, so it's based on random randomness. So if you want to add, for example, a Bayesian model to that, it's probably going to give really good results, yes. And the second one, I'm not, uh, even for I've done a lot of it models, and I really use Spark. And is Spark, uh, let's say there's a model which uses GPUs. Is there some kind of support for GPUs or CPUs? So if you run it on Hopsworks, uh, we have our own version of, of the Yarn resource manager, which supports GPUs as a resource, and you can allocate the GPUs to your executors. Um, so, for example, here, if I had, I it, on this cluster, I don't have GPUs right now. But uh, if you have GPUs, you would be able to say, um, "Give me one GPU per executor," uh, for example. And yeah, the whole platform is open source, so you can go and try that. Okay, that's all we have time for. Thank you very much, Moritz. Thank you.